The following program is made possible by the generous sponsorship of Crestcom Bank, serving our community and our veterans with full-service banking and convenient locations, and by Agape Senior Center, providing quality senior health care for our community and our veterans from residential locations in Conway and Garden City. From the campus of Coastal Carolina University, the Center for Military and Veteran Studies is pleased to present Military Memoirs. Hello and welcome to Military Memoirs. I'm Rod Gregg and our guest on this program today is the Reverend Paul Tompkins of Conway, South Carolina, who is a veteran of the Korean War and also as a survivor of 34 months in a prisoner of war camp uh, under the rule of the Chinese Communists during the Korean War. Uh, Pastor Tompkins, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you, Brother Rod. You grew up here in Horry County in, in the 1930s and 40s, and uh, you had a pretty challenging time in those days. Yes, sir, it was. And, uh it looked sometimes like we might not make it, but we did. We were saved, I guess, by the military. <laughs> in 1948, you would join the military and you joined the Army. Now, why did you do that? I never had left Horry County very much. And that was one opportunity to see some of the world. Well, in the world you saw was occupied Japan, <laughs> and you were in the 243rd Transportation Company, U.S. Army, uh, and you were unloading and loading cargo ships in occupied Japan three years after World War II ended. Now, what was occupied Japan like in those days? Well, it was a bunch of smokestacks. I was in the two largest cities in Japan, Yokohama and Tokyo. Tokyo was the second largest city in the world before it was bombed out. You were there in 49 and in 1950, and you were there with the Army uh, when uh, the North uh, Koreans invaded South Korea and ignited the Korean War. You volunteered to leave Japan and, and go to that war, and, yes, sir. and you saw a lot of combat in Korea engaging with the North Koreans. All the way from Daegu, that was from September up to uh, November up on the Yellow River until we had either killed or captured every North Korean soldier. When we saw all these torches on the opposite side of the river and heard them giving commands with the, with the buglers, and they started coming across the river. So the Chinese came across the Yalu River where you were, and uh, they then attacked your positions. And you could see them coming. How many do you think uh, they were compared to the American forces? I'd never seen so many troops in all my life. I knew we had no chance with them, but we didn't run. We did not run until they told us to retreat. So they overran your lines? They overrun our lines, and they, they, they were just too many. And you got an order to retreat? We got an order to retreat. Well, were you losing troops around you where you were? Oh, yes. It was, it was being shot down around me like, like flies. They were, we, we had no chance. We were just so outnumbered. We made a perimeter at first before we retreated. And uh, we shot until all of our ammunition was gone. And that's when uh, I come to Commander Boatwright he gave orders for us to retreat and try to get back down south. Well, what were your feelings? This was something totally unexpected, wasn't it? Totally unexpected. My uh, foxhole buddy and I, we had three rifles between us. And as a normal thing, one of us would shoot while the other one loaded. And that, that kept us engaged all the time. Because as the Chinese assaulted your positions. Well, how did you pick targets when there were so many? You didn't have to worry about it. There was a target in front of you. If you had, if you had time to aim, there was a target in front of you. 
you wouldn't believe it. You would have to see it to believe it. We've seen them shot in piles. So what were your feelings when you heard the order to retreat? Well, I knew we had to do something because we didn't have any ammunition. Most everybody was out of ammunition. You know, you wouldn't have stood a, a chance hand-to-hand -hand combat. So they couldn't get the ammo back out fast enough after they took it up, and then you were over, overrun. So what did you do? I did what they told me to do. I retreated. Me and two more, we stayed together, and we were captured together. Well, we're going to talk about that uh, more in a moment, about uh, your time as a prisoner of war under the Chinese Communists, and we'll be back uh, in just a moment. They're all around us. They're the men and women who served in our nation's armed forces. In good times and bad, they've been willing to stand in harm's way to preserve, protect, and defend the legacy of freedom we enjoy as Americans. All of them gave some, and some of them gave all. We owe them a lot. So the next time you see an American veteran, say thank you for all of us. Welcome back to Military Memoirs. Our guest today is the Reverend Paul Tompkins, a veteran of the Korean War, and also a survivor of 34 months as a prisoner of war under the Communist Chinese. You were telling us before we went to a break how the, the Chinese invaded over the Yalu River in, in Korea where you were as a, a rifleman and uh, your lines were overrun and you, were, you got the order to retreat. How were you captured? We, uh, as we split up, we didn't have any ammunition and so every man just retreated and some of us went in greater numbers than others. And there were three of us that went together. And we stayed together as we moved down south, trying to get ahead of the Chinese that had already come over. And we stopped in this little village and we found uh, a chicken and we found some rice. And there was an elderly man and woman that was in there. We couldn't speak their language, but we tried to assure them we wouldn't harm them. And being the southern boy that I was, I knew how to cook a chicken bog. And uh, so I did that. We so cooked, up, cooked up a chicken bog. So you're fleeing from the, the Chinese army and, and you managed to cook a, a, a low country chicken bog in, in Korea. <laughs> well, uh, seriously, how, how were you overtaken by the, the, uh, the Chinese army? Getting ready to tell you right now. We were eating that chicken. We had one man on watch. I was cooking. The other guy was guarding, and one was out, outside. And uh, as we turned around to eat, no one was watching, but there was five people watching us on the outside. And they they jumped us, and they captured us, stood us up outside the building. I thought they were going to shoot us. I really thought my time had come. And uh, they didn't shoot us. They tied us up with telephone wire, took our boots. We had no jacket or nothing. We had a shirt and pair of pants. Well, this is wintertime. Yes. We, uh, we started marching up north, and it started snowing. Temperature began to fall, and we were about to freeze. And we came to a village, and they put us in the hog pen, put a guard with us. We slept with the hogs. We caught their lice. And that rice, it, it, their lice was about the size of a grain of rice. And they sucked the blood out of us. And the stubbles of the rice were sticking up through the snow. And we walked barefooted across that field and it pierced our feet. Blood flowed from our feet. You could trace us across the mountain. And an airplane flew over. One of our airplanes flew over. And he tipped his wings at us. He, re he let us know he recognized us. But uh, just a little farther up, we found some more people 
or we run into some more scouts and they had some more that were captured. And before two or three days were over with, we ran into a, a big group that had been captured. And they finally got us all together and were trying to decide what to do with us. They had no POW camp. They had no way to feed us. And they had no way to do anything with us. And so they were trying to decide what to do with us. We were captured by the, the Koreans, but the Chinese are the ones that took us over. And they took us to a, a fishing village by the name, by the name of Piak Tong, right on the Yale River. And they took the civilians out of the fishing village and they put us in their mud huts. There was some 3,000 of us in that POW camp. 3,000 American troops. 3,000 American troops. And we had no, no water. The uh, river was frozen over. We had no food. They fed us dry corn. And that dry corn, <coughs> it broke some of the fillings out of the men's teeth and it cut our intestines. We began to bleed. Our intestine became infected. Worms set in. We were passing 25 to 30 times, 30 worms a time that we would go to the restroom. And we were so, our stomach was so upset until we could hardly live. There was no place to go to a latrine. There was no latrine. It was a, a terrible place. How long uh, were you there before you were moved? They had no place to move us to. That was in November. In uh, late November, I escaped. Me and two more guys escaped. And it was at night that we were escaping. How did and you get out? We walked out. They had a... Uh, and the river was on one side and, and there was an entrance kind of like between two mountains and uh, they put wire across the entrance of it. We went out over the mountain and we had no idea how the mountain curved on the other side. We stepped off the mountain, almost broke our backs. All three of us stepped off and they liked to beat us to death. They recaptured you. They recaptured us. They almost beat us to death. And they took us back into camp. So after you were recaptured, your, how was your treatment? <clears throat> they, kind of, they, they finally got some organization to the thing. They began to try to teach us their way of life, communism, and uh, they would set us down in the snow eight hours a day and try to teach us their way of living. And they couldn't teach some of us, and so they shipped us out. We had to make another prison of war camp, and they shipped us up in the most rugged part of the mountains on the Yellow River. And we made a PW camp. So you and others who had escaped or who resisted or um, who they deemed to be, uh, I guess, troublemakers, they sent you to a special camp. That's true. And what was the treatment like there? Well, we were all alike. <laughs> it was terrible. We had nothing. We had nothing to eat. We had uh, no toilet, no way to shave, no way to cut our hair, no way to brush our teeth, no way to use the restroom, no way to drink water from the river. We had nothing. We were almost deteriorated. We were so nasty until you could peel the 
get dirt off your hands. We were the most sorriest looking bunch of people you'd ever seen in your life. How did you survive that kind of treatment, that kind of environment? I have no idea. Only God knows. I do not know. But we escaped again. Three of us got together, and it was 500 yards across the Yale River. We went across the river and made it up the other side. We were over in China, and we stayed over there for three days before we were captured. We uh, found a, a roast in their corn. It was in August. We found a roast in their patch and hot pepper. And that's not the best diet in the world, but it's good when you're hungry. When you're starving. <laughs> when you're starving, and we were starving. And we ran into an attack position. We were traveling at night. There was an anti-aircraft gun up there shooting our planes. And uh, <clears throat> we ran into them, and we were recaptured. They brought us down the mountain and turned us over to the civilian police. And uh, it was early in the morning. And they set us out in the middle of the road. And they stoned us. They let the uh, people coming by going to work. They let them stone us. I kind of know how Stephen felt in the sixth chapter of the book of Acts, how they stoned Stephen. The difference between me and Stephen, he was calling on Jesus. And I wasn't, I didn't know Jesus. But they almost killed us. What were you thinking when that was going on? I didn't think I would die. I really didn't. I was thinking about, I'm, I'm going to make it through this. And we did. We had some scars, but we made it through it. And they took us back into camp, and they give us a kangaroo court. They tried us, and um, I thought they were going to kill me. They uh, had me to dig a hole. And I said, well, as soon as I get it dug, they're going to shoot me, and I'll fall into it, and they'll cover me up. But they put me in that hole, and I stayed in that hole 30 days. I had to urinate, defecate, and sleep in that hole. How large was this hole? It was not It was not very large. I could lay down in it. About the size of a, a grave? Something similar to that. And uh, they kept it covered. I couldn't see no daylight, no stars. And they kept a guard by it where I couldn't get out. And they told me when, I, when, they, when they let me out that the next time that I surrender, uh, I escaped, that they were going to send me to the salt mines in Russia. And just before they turned us loose, we were getting ready to escape again. We had learned a little more about which way to travel. We could follow the Yale River and come out at the dam. Why were you so determined to escape? We couldn't live inside that place. We buried them 40 a day. 40 a day. American troops. Yes, sir. It was, it was so... It was so cold, you couldn't dig a hole in the ground. You had to lay them on top of the ground. And surely cholera would set in sometime or another. But um, we had no medication. We were eat up with worms. We had a disease in the camp called beriberi. So the greatest suffering occurred um, in your camp less from uh, intentional mistreatment by guards and more by the conditions that were there of starvation and uh, lack of clothing and, and all of that. That's true. But what did you feel when you were put in a grave for 30 days? Well, I, I thought I was gone in a, in a way. 
I was trying to figure out how could I get out of this? You know, you got a good man standing right there at me. And he would keep me in there at night and I'd work hard labor in the daytime. I'd have to tote water from the kitchen, uh, from the Gator River up to the kitchen, two five gallon buckets on an idiot stick. And uh, I had to cut some holes in the bank of the river that I could come up out of that uh, river. Of course, that was doing me good. That was making me stronger, helping me out. I didn't know people could live under such circumstances as that. What were you given to eat when you were doing that, that kind of heavy Rice labor? cake. All they gave me was with the crumbs. We had, uh, our rice had worms in it. We had to pick worms out of it. Soybeans were cooked in such a manner that they had so much gas on them until it, it just tortured you. And they had potatoes to eat, had large turnips, they call them condacks. But we really had some very sorry food. It, it kept you alive, and that's, and that's about it. What was the survival rate for Americans in that camp, do you know? We had a 50% ratio to die the first winter. And we had uh, we had Australians, we had Turks, Englishmen, Canadians, Americans. All the Allied forces. All the Allied forces. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're in the worst of that, did you have hope that you were going to get out? I did. I did. I didn't know how. I really couldn't see any way. Under the situation that we were in, I seen no way of getting out, but I had hope. You know, I really never lost hope, really, after my uh, vow to God in the, in the foxhole. When I vowed to God during that rice paddy when my ammunition ran out, that if he'd bring me home, I'd serve him the rest of my life. I never thought I'd die in a prison of war camp. What about your friends? Your two friends? We, uh, one of them made it out. One of them was from Florida. He, uh, came back to see me while, while he was on vacation one time. <clears throat> so one friend survived. What happened to the other friend? I don't know. I don't know. How did you finally get out of the camp? We, uh, had a prisoner exchange in August of 1953. August the 20, 28th, I was a free man. How did you hear this was gonna happen and what did you think when you heard it? Well, one month before that, they called us downtown one night. They were, they were pretty good at waking us up in the middle of the night and calling us out for head check to see if anybody had escaped. We had no electric lights and nothing of that nature, but they would call us out and they would shine lights on us. And uh, they had a little village where they had another camp and we would meet each other down there. So they called us out and didn't say nothing to us. They just marched us over to this little camp, which was maybe two miles or more down the, down the road. And that night the company commander Want to speak to us. I really thought they were shipping us out to China, uh, Russia, one or the other. And they told us that the company commander had had an announcement he wanted to make. And he said, one month from the day, you'll be a free man. Yeah, you'll be a free man. And we couldn't understand nothing else he said. He said that in English. Yeah, yes. He had an interpreter. Everybody just screamed, including myself, hollered and ripped and reared. Finally got it back down where we could understand what he was saying. He told us what was going to transpire. One month they would start, they would begin moving us out, moving us back to the front. 
while you were there, you uh, you suffered a lot, including the, lo the you lost uh, use of uh, your right hand in some ways. Yes, I, I lost a lot of things, really. <clears throat> but um, I um, I don't know if, if if I would have been a better man or not. I really don't know. But I learned a lot as I was a prisoner of war. I learned who real friends were. And I learned who the enemy of America was. And I learned that those history books that I read about the patriarchs of old. And those that wrote the Declaration of Our Independence. I learned those, those were great men. And I learned to appreciate them. And I learned to look to those kind of men because they knew what America was about. They knew what it take to have a, a free and a true America. And then sitting in, in, in that church on Sunday morning, God came to me and said, Paul, you know what you promised me. I got up from that seat, ran down to that altar, and gave my heart to God. That made it all, Brother Rod. Well, and you spent 50 years as a Christian pastor. Yes, sir. But I don't believe I'm through yet. <laughs> I think you're right. You know, I'm like an old lighthouse now. I'm just shining. Well, it's, uh, I know that it's uh, been a pleasure to, to get to know you, and we certainly do uh, see your light shine in, in many ways. And when you look back as a veteran on your service in the Korean War, and on your 34 months as a prisoner of war under the uh, Chinese Communists, how do you feel about that now? I forgive all of them that done anything to me. There was one time I really, when I lost those fingers, fingers, I lost a part of me. And people looked at me as being, you know, a part of a man. But, uh, and I really hated the guy that put that water on my hand and cut that circulation of that blood off and my fingers froze. I really hated that guy. But when I give my heart to God, I pray for God to remove that hate. And He did. I don't hate Him anymore. Mm. Well, you survived those 34 months and you came back uh, to the United States honorably discharged. Uh, you earned the Korean War Medal, United Nations Medal, Combat Infantry Badge, 10 Bronze Stars, and a POW Medal. You uh, married, uh, uh, when you came back, uh, Rudell Marlowe of Horry County, had uh, four children, two boys, two girls, uh, seven grandchildren, and five great-grandchildren, and uh, a marriage at 84, uh, going on 60 years now. So I, I just want to tell you, and I know I speak for many people, I want to thank you for your, for your service to our country. And uh, I want to thank you for being willing to share your story with us on this program. Thank you. And we thank want to thank you, too, uh, for joining us for Military Memoirs. The preceding program was brought to you through the generous support of Agape Senior Center, providing quality senior health care from residential locations in Conway and Garden City. And by Crestcom Bank, serving our community and our veterans with full-service banking and convenient locations.